he said that back in the day, and we're going back when he was the chief rabbi of Israel, with one hand, you were able to count how many Sephardic yeshivot exist in Eres Israel. Today, there is barely a city that does not have Sephardic yeshivot, and many cities have many of them, and he brought a tremendous amount of pride in reactivating a lot of the Sephardic halachic ruling, in, 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 in bringing, and we need to understand one thing, and has shalom, I'm, I'm avoiding to say something that may not sound right, but regretfully, for many, many years, the Sephardic presence in Israel was there physically, but there was not really so much in the Torah venue. He brought pride to the Sephardic Hachamim. He brought pride to the Sephardic Minhagim. He brought pride of understanding, as we have heard many, many, many months ago. If you go to a yeshiva, okay? Okay, you go to a yeshiva. What do you see in the bookshelves? Books. Do you know that the foundation of Talmud studies is based on Sephardic rabbinics like the Rambam, Maimonides, Nachmanides, Rashba, Ritba, the Reef, the Ran, all these names that I'm telling you, Meshai, it came a thousand years later. So at this moment, they cannot talk about the Benishai for one reason. Because Acham over the Yosef loved the Benishai, but he made some adjustments to the rulings of the Benishai. So the book of the Benishai, it is a book of halacha. The Talmudic book of the Benishai, it's called Ben Yehoyada. That is the Talmudic commentary of the Benishai. Like, I'm not referring to that because the Benishai was barely 110 years ago. And God forbid, I hope the Benishai is not upset to what I'm saying. I'm not minimizing the greatness of the Benishai. We grew up with the Benishai, not physically, intellectually. You understand? For many, 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 many generations, Benishai, Hida, were the only Sephardic authorities that we had in Halakha including Rabbi Haim Palachi, including the Mo'ed Kol Hai, including the Kafa Haim, Hacham Yaakov Sofer. So no one can deny that each one of these Sadiqim, each one on their generation, it created a revolution in the aspect of Sephardic Alakha. But the Rishonim, the Rishonim, we going back a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago. We had Rashi, that was a great Rishon. We have the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, a great Rishon. But the bulk of the Rishonim follow the Sephardic heritage and the Sephardic tradition. And based on, and this is, by the way, mandatory learning, including in Ashkenazic Yeshivot. And God forbid, I'm not saying Sephardic and Ashkenazic to create a separation. God forbid, the opposite. Kulam Ahubim, Kulam Berurim, Kulam Giborim. They are all holy, they are all pure, they are all beautiful, and we love everyone. But we need to understand a bit of history. There were many generations of great Sephardic giants, but regretfully, due to the Inquisition and many other challenges in the Sephardic world historically, regretfully, we don't have great caliber hachamim until we came back later to approximately 200, 250 years ago. I need to clarify, it doesn't mean that there were no hachamim. There were great hachamim. In every generation, we need to have hachamim. If we don't have hachamim, how do we survive? This is what the parasha says in this week's Torah portion. Tamim haya bedorotav. Dorotav means in their generation. Every generation must have Talmidei Hachamim that understand the generation. And that's something that I saw written once 
in a book, I think it's called Pelaot Edoteja, a great book on the Torah portion. And there he explains that every generation of people can relate to a specific Talmud Hacham of their generation that understands them. Remember, I mentioned this inside. The rabbi used to travel from city to city to give nightly shiurim. Today, it's very easy. You have a good booking agent. You have a driver. It takes you around. Air conditioning, Wi-Fi, live feed, light transmission, Lighthouse Torah project, itorah.com. We have all these platforms that is just, okay, what time do you want me to be there? I'll be there. Make sure the air conditioning is on. But in the olden days, especially in his time, how did he travel from city to city to give a speech every night? Taking the public bus. Later on, a driver was found. Later on, somebody gave the rabbi a car as a gift to be taken with kavod to each class because the time spent in the bus was considered for him a waste of time. Not because he wasted the time, but he could have made the time more productive. And this is a known fact in the life of Acham Obadiah Yosef, Zecher Sadiq Livracha, that he valued time, he learned non-stop. And when we say non-stop, there were times that he forgot to eat. There were times that he didn't sleep. I mean, for us, it sounds like a, 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 a something from a book of magic that someone in our days on the 21st century can forget to eat. Do you forget to eat? Do you forget to sleep? Guess what? In his case, he did. Not because of his mind wasn't clear. The opposite. He was so much immersed in the Torah that this was his favorite pastime. Let's go forward. There was a story that we heard a few years back when his son, Hacham David Yosef Shelita, was in town. And he shared the story about his father, Alava Shalom, that later on it became public. Regretfully, a few years prior to the rabbi's passing, he was affected by a heart condition. A heart condition. His son takes him to the doctor. The doctor makes the checking. He says, Hacham, from here, I already admitted you to the hospital. You need to be admitted. Your life is in danger. The rabbi says, I'm sorry. I need to go back to finish writing a halachic ru ruling. The doctor said, Rabbi, you don't understand? If you leave the hospital, I'm not sure you're coming back alive. You need to go and do this procedure now. You're a walking, ticking time bomb. That was the word utilized. The rabbi said, no, I cannot, I cannot, I must go back home. The son, which was obviously much younger when this story happened, asked his father, dad, what's the problem? Do the procedure, recover, and then you continue your writing. What's the problem? The doctor is telling you, pikuach nefesh. The doctor is telling you, if you leave the hospital and you come back home, I'm not sure if you're going to remain alive. That's what the doctor is saying in plain English. The rabbi starts crying and it says, I understand what the doctor is saying, but you need to know, if they do the surgery on me, I may make it alive back, I may not. But I'm in the middle of answering a situation of an aguna. Aguna in English means a lady that the whereabouts of the husbands are unknown. We don't know, is he alive? Is he dead? There were two times in history, in our modern day times, that there were an exorbitant amount of ladies affected by this halachic challenge. One was the Yom Kippur War. 
And second time was 9-11. I spoke about this back then. 9-11, there were close to 200 Jewish women that the whereabouts of the husband were not known. Did they die really in 9-11? Or maybe someone escaped because he wasn't happy in his marriage. Maybe he owed a lot of money. Maybe he couldn't stand marriage. God forbid. I'm only telling you the scenarios. According to the halakha, you need to have proof, God forbid, that a husband is dead. There are many ways of proving if the husband is dead, if the husband was in the tower. How do you know that the husband was in the tower? Maybe he stopped by the coffee shop down the block. I know he says, you know what? I'm leaving. God forbid. But the halakha doesn't take anything for granted. Everything needs to be researched and investigated. This is called in Jewish law, she'el derisha v'hakira. Investigation and research. Or research and investigation. So guess what? 9-11 study case was based on the rulings of Hacham Obadiah Yosef in the Yom Kippur War. So the happy ending of the story was that the rabbi was given permission to go home, finish writing the responsa, and come back to the hospital. And Baruch Hashem, that same night, the rabbi came back to the hospital alive. The surgery took place. And Baruch Hashem, he lived for many, many years after uh, this surgery. This is one story. Another story related to his marriage. His father owned a mehila to his childhood. His father owned a grocery store in Jerusalem. Makole, they call it. A grocery store. Not public supermarket. Heke, a two-by-two grocery store that the owner knows everybody by name. And if you have no money to pay, he puts it on the bill, right? The good old days of the Holy Land of Israel. Sure. And he put his son to work. Remember I mentioned that back in the day, there were a handful of yeshivot. One of the yeshivot was Porat Yosef, the famous Porat Yosef yeshiva in Jerusalem. And Hacham eh, Atiye, I believe, came to the father of Hacham Obadiah Yosef because he did not see him in the yeshiva learning. And he came and asked, why your son is not learning? He's not coming to the Kitab, to the Talmud Torah. He says, because he needs to help me in the grocery. Hacham Atiyah says, let's make a deal. I come to work for you in the grocery and you send your son to learn to the yeshiva just to understand that from a very young age, he was already known as a great Torah giant. And they asked him once in an interview, how do you know so much Torah? Do you have photographic memory? He said, no, I don't have. So how come do you have? He says, very simple. I prayed a lot and I cry a lot. Cry in the sense of begging Hashem, enabling the Torah to enter the brain of the person. And when he spoke, if you saw him speaking, you know, he spoke like an encyclopedia. Open, topic, and one great thing, that the way of speaking, there are many different ways of speaking, okay? If it's in a kolel setting, is one type of speaking. If it's in a business-like setting, is a different type of speaking. But when he spoke to the masses, his greatness was in part that he was able to take a complicated halachic matter and dissect it and explain it to the audience that even the simplest person was able to understand it which this by itself is a great attribute to have. He believed, as the Baal Shem Tov says, 
in the essence of every Jew. And hence the story that I said inside. In his early days, you know, he was known as Rabbi Obadiah Yosef. That's all. Okay, another rabbi. Okay, he's a Fardic rabbi who spoke very eloquently. So in the early days, when they organized Shi'urim, there was not masses. I remember when I was in Israel visiting and I went to his Shi'urim, we're talking about minimum seven, eight hundred people, a thousand people, and sometimes much more. Depends on the situation. But do you think he started like that large? He started with two, three, four people. And one day, and one day, he was asked, you're talking to three people, you don't need the microphone, sit down in front, face to face, 15 minutes, and get it over with. You know what the great rabbi said? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your future generations. And guess what? Because of his sacrifice of traveling night after night, as I said inside, in a public transportation buses of Israel. If America had double buses then with air conditioning, in Israel was a roll down window bus, like school buses, but go back to the 70s. Can you imagine? We cannot imagine. My school bus in the 70s didn't have air conditioning or Wi-Fi. And it was a very hard seat, right? And you have to wait in the corner until the boss comes. It says that this sacrifice that he made for many, many years in his life, his mission was how to reactivate the neshama of a Yehudi. Because at the end of the day, as we may have mentioned in the past, the neshama of a Yehudi is good. Elokai neshama shenatata bi tehorahi. The soul is good. The yeserara sometimes darkens certain areas of life. But he believed that if a Yehudi is exposed to true Torah essence, the neshama will flourish. And this is what one of the great hachamim, I think Rabbi Steinman, alava shalom, also a mega Ashkenazic giant, that he witnessed, and I think we all witness, Hacham Obadiah Yosef's burial was the largest in the history of the state of Israel. The numbers fluctuate between 800,000 to a million Yehudim. 800,000, by the way, is the police version. In a few hours. In a few hours. And guess what? Every group was there. Sephardic Ashkenazic. Black Kippah needed Kippah. Yes Kippah, no Kippah. Different hats. Different yeshivas, different Hasidic, different groups, white socks, black socks, no red socks, by the way. Okay? Streimel, Spodik, black hat, gray hat, no hat. You understand? Can you imagine? Let's go on the conservative number of 800,000 <coughs> Yehudim come to a burial. We cannot imagine that. I saw it in the videos, in the live videos. And I can imagine how many thousands of people are today and were there yesterday in the Kever in Sanhedrin, in the middle of Jerusalem. One of the things that I visit, one of the holy places that I visit when I go to Jerusalem is the grave of Hacham Obadiah Yosef and pray. And you see constantly people men, women, and children coming to pray for whatever need they may have. Now, Rishtayman says, when you see that so many different Yehudim came to his burial, now you understand who that person was. Sometimes when certain Sadiqim passed away, you see a lot of people. One of the newscasters from Israel 
said that he was very impressed because even when a president or prime minister of Israel, God forbid, passes away or passed away, there was never the masses like you see in the Orthodox movement. The kavod that people have to the hachamim. In his case, even though he passed away six years ago only, but no one can deny that his writings, his teachings are alive and well. Through many of the responses, Yabiya Omer, Hazan Obadia, then you have Alacha Berura, written by his son, Hacham David Yosef Shelita, that is based on the rulings of Hacham Yosef. Then you have the other son, Hacham Ishak Yosef, the ones coming to Miami on Sunday. He wrote the Yalkut Yosef. But the originators of these books were Hacham Obadia Yosef. And guess what? Which synagogue today doesn't learn his rulings? Which kolel, which yeshiva? They are synagogues, I know for a fact, they are called Kahal Obadiah Yosef. The name of the knees is Obadiah Yosef. And they do it to give kavod to the great rabbi, and the synagogue obviously follows his halachic rulings, which is fine. In the Syrian world, many of the halachic rulings are based on the rulings of Hacham Obadiah Yosef, Zecher Sadiq, Livracha. And obviously, Maybe the lesson that we can derive from his life was about sacrifice. When he was about to marry his wife, he told his wife in the beginning of the dating, you need to know my life is devoted to Torah learning. I'm not looking to go out to restaurants. I'm not looking to travel. I'm not looking to go on vacation. I want Torah for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And guess what? She accepted it. To the point that they used to live in such an amount of poverty. Poverty. His dwelling, his home, was an efficiency. That the dining room was the bedroom. And the dining room became the area to meet with the rabbis. And the dining room had the built-in kitchen. And this is how he lived in his early days of marriage. And even through life. You know what was his biggest asset? His Torah books. I went to his home several times. I went to his library to meet with him, to get a blessing. And I even went to his library after he finished his life in the physical world. You don't see the wall of the library. You see bookshelves from the top to bottom, books and books and books and books and books, plain furniture and plenty of books. And I will tell you, many of these books were very old, but every book was open and every book was touched and every book had comments written on them. This was the love affair, if we can say such a thing, between Hacham Obadiah Yosef and the Torah. This was the love of his life. Of obviously, he was happily married, every one of his children, a great Armit Hacham on his right, married, etc. But all that doesn't happen automatically. This came from his effort, from his sacrifice, and his willingness to sacrifice his life for the sake of Torah. And that's why he was able to restore the glory and pride of the Sephardic heritage, especially in Israel, which regretfully, many years back, there were discrepancies and separation between Sephardic and Ashkenazic behaviors, traditions, ruling, customs, etc. But many of the great giants, there was another great Sephardic giant, by Ashkenazic giant by the name of Rabbi uh, Eliashiv, Yosef Shalom Eliashiv, Zecher Sadiq Livracha, also a mega Sadiq who sat together with Hacham Obadiah Yosef 
in the Bedin in Jerusalem for many, many, many years. And he says, whatever Hakam Ovedia Yosef says, Amen. There was a discussion, a known discussion between the Sephardic and Ashkenazic halachic rulings concerning the purity of grape juice. Which beracha to say on the grape juice? Some opinions say Shehakol in Israel, not in America. For your peace of mind, I read this article many years back, and I believe it's the same, that the Kedem grape juice, etc., it's, it's halachically uh, according to the Sephardic tradition, Beracha Boreperia Geffen. But we go back 30, 40 years ago when the aspect of kosher wine, it wasn't so developed like it is today and so precise, there was a question in Israel if the grape juice was really grape juice or it was water with sugar and sediment that dyed the, the grape juice in the color of grape juice. And once there was a chuppah, and the great rabbi said, Sheakol niyavit baro, on grape juice. On grape juice. I'm clarifying this for the audience watching and listening. I'm only sharing a story that happened 40 to 50 years ago. We're not talking about today. Today, based on his alachic ruling, there was an upgrade in the status of the grape juice. The rabbi also created a revolution with the Basar Bet Yosef, the Bet Yosef meat, also known in Israel as Halak Bet Yosef. The reactivation of Yashan, the activation of Sephardic observances in many, many, many ways. And you need to know that in his time, there were many parallel to his time there were many Sephardic giants that you know, that learned with him. Hacham Baruch, alav shalom. Hacham Sion Levi, alav shalom, from Panama. Hacham Baruch, from Brooklyn. Hacham Sion Levi, from Panama. Uh, was Hacham Ben Sion Abba Shaul, from Jerusalem. And many other great giants that we can call them, perhaps the dream team of Yeshiva Borat Yosef. And each and every one of them became a Torah giant on their own. But it only it reinforces what I said before. These Talmideh Hachamim, they sacrifice themselves for the sake of Torah, for the sake of helping people, for the sake of restoring the Sephardic heritage in the life of Am Israel. So Yehidatzon Kahal Kadosh. That the Zechut of Hacham Obadiah Yosef, Zechus Adig Livracha, Yagen Aleinu, may shield upon us, and very soon we'll have the Yeshua, we'll have the redemption of Am Israel, and we'll have the Zechut of seeing him again, together with all of the Sadikim that preceded our generations. Bimerave Yamenu, Amen. This was the first part of the class. Don't go anywhere. Why are you running? I gave you a break for three days. Right? I got already a couple of complaints. I should record remotely. Shalom bayit, reasons I cannot do it. Baruch atta Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam she'akol nihiyavit baro. I'm not going to keep you too long. I'm going to speak about Perashat Noah. Next week, we need to be very careful with time because we're switching the clock on Mosai Shabbat. So next week, Shabbat here in Miami will be around 5, 5 something, 5, 5.15, something like that. But okay, Be'ezat Hashem will deal with it accordingly. Let me give you an introduction to the Zohar of today. The Perasha, Noah. We already spoke about Noah Sunday and Monday, but I'd like to use one particular Gemara, and then we go to the Zohar of today. The Gemara discusses 
the topic of how a person should speak. We already know the answer. Speak nice, properly, respectfully. But today's lesson is about to use a clean language when a person speaks. The only question is, what do we consider clean language and not clean language? Not clean language can be considered vulgarity, could be considered profanity, can be considered cursing, etc. This is according to our standards. But let's see what is the Torah standards of what does it mean to speak in a clean way. The Gemara in Masechet Pesachim discusses, right here, beautiful, discusses an interesting halachic concept. The Mishnah begins, or le arba'a asar, to the 14th of Nisan, to the light of the 14th of Nisan, but kimeta hames le oraner, we search the hames with a candle. We know this halacha, right? The night before Pesach, what do we do at home? We take a candle, we search the hames. Comes the Gemara in Pesachim and ask, my or, what is the meaning of the word or? What's the meaning of the word or? Help me. Light. 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 So here is the Gemara question. Light means daytime or nighttime? Daytime. Okay? So comes the Gemara and asks, if it's daytime, why do you need a candle? I don't need a flashlight during the day. Do I need a flashlight to see something in this room? Why not? Because I have natural light. So the Gemara says, if the purpose of the candle is because I'm searching the Hames at night, why doesn't the Mishnah start by saying, Lel Arba'a Asar, to the night of the 14, we search for the Hames? That would be easier. And you could have saved three pages of Talmudic discussion and on the word or, you know what the Gemara concludes why the Mishnah began with the word or? The Gemara says in Pesachim, Le'olam al yotzi adam davar megune mipiv. Forever. A person should not bring something unpleasant from their mouth. I ask you a question. What does it mean in your mind, unpleasant? To most of us, is to say something that is not nice. You know what is the Talmudic proof of what does it mean unpleasant? Today's perasha. God says to Noah, bring animals to the teva, right? What word the Torah uses to convey this message. The Pasuk says, Mina Behema Atehora, Umina Behema Asher Enena Tehora. I'm gonna put this in writing to illustrate the Talmud. Asher Enena Tehora. Three Five, five. How many letters? Five and five is ten. And thirteen, thirteen letters. I ask you a question. What is the meaning of asher enena tehora? Which is not pure, right? What other word is found in the Torah to tell me the same thing? Huh? Tame. How many letters are the word Tame? Three. So the Gemara says, you could have said the word Tame 
sorry, I forgot how to do this. How many words, how many letters, I could have said the word, mina behema tehora, for the animal which is pure, or behema hatemea. So the Gemara, when the Torah gave me, because hatemea means the impure, five letters, I have five out of 13, the Gemara, the Torah wrote eight additional letters in order not to say the word me. I ask you a question. Is it a big deal to say the word tame, impure? No. Cursing someone is worse. Four letter words. God forbid. Don't use your imagination. In Spanish it's longer. You understand? The Gemara says if I don't have to say the word tame, I go the extra mile. And later on, by the way, in the Torah, especially in Perashat Shemini, when the Torah teaches us the laws of kosher and non-kosher animals, the Torah uses the word tame, teme'a. And the Gemara and the Mefarshim explains the reason why the Torah, when it's telling me the loss of kashrut, if I tell you, better not to, what do you understand? Maybe yes, but if I tell you, tame, for sure you're not going to touch it. So because Perashat Noah, it is not a Perashat that teaches me the loss of kashrut. So therefore the Torah says, if I don't have to say the word tame, I'm going to add eight letters in the Torah not to say the word tame. Now, with this explanation, now we understand why the Mishnah began with the word or. Or means light. Light means positive. Lel, Laila, means what? Night. What's the difference between day and night? Clarity and darkness. A Jew is never in darkness. Sure, we may have the physical darkness because the sun set, but spiritually, a Jew cannot say, I'm in such a darkness. Torah, it's light. Ner, the candle, is the mitzvah. Not only that, Lel, I'm not going to dwell too much in this, Laila, why it's called Laila, Laila? Why night it's called Laila? You know why? You're ready to listen to their reason? I don't want to frighten you. They are the power, the power of darkness at night, they are called this way. I'm not going to say the name. L-I-L-I-T. You heard of this before? That's the female power of darkness that roams the world at night. That's why it's called Laila. And that's why in Sephardic heritage, we don't say Laila Tov. What do we say? Betov Talinu. Berahamim Takisu is the answer. Betov Talinu means go to sleep with goodness. And we say the word Betov. We say the word good before going to sleep. And we answer Berahamim Takisu. May you wake up tomorrow with compassion. That is the way that those who know say good night. We don't say night good. We say good first. Why do I give you this introduction? Because the Zohar of today discusses about the importance of proper speech during Shabbat. 
this is what the Zohar of today talks about. The Zohar says that observing Shabbat is not limited on the celebration as we discussed last week or what don't I do on Shabbat. Okay, I don't open the office on Shabbat, I don't use the cell phone on Shabbat, I don't send messages on Shabbat. All that is beautiful and keep doing it. But what do you talk about on Shabbat? What are the topics that we discuss? Hello? What are the topics that we discuss on Shabbat? So the Zohar Kadosh, and I'm going to be very brief in this. So this will be finished in the next two minutes, three minutes, by Zet Hashem. The Zohar Kadosh writes and it says that part of the sanctity of the Shabbat is the speech of the Shabbat. And here he's not referring to the rabbi's speech on Shabbat. He's talking about the topics that a person used to talk on Shabbat. It's just like there is the celebration of the Shabbat and the observance of the Shabbat. There is a power of the speech that a person can reveal on Shabbat. And the Pasuk calls it from Yob, Megale Amukot. The revelation of the deep aspects. You know what the Zohar says? That this refers to what the person speaks about. The speech is a result of the brain. Right? And the Gemara already mentioned, and we already mentioned it several times, that as long as the person doesn't speak, we are in charge. Once the person speaks, we became slave of our words. If I said something nice, Chazak Baruch. But if I said something that I regret, now those words are haunting me, so to speak. So the Zohar Kadosh writes and it says that when a person on Shabbat talks about things which are not suitable for the sanctity of Shabbat, it's only demonstrating that in his mind he's not on Shabbat mode because the power of speech is connected to the brain, to the power of the intellect of the person. And I'm not referring intellect on the essence of cultural intellect. I'm talking about what are you thinking about? That's why they say, think before you speak. But this is not only about the Shonara and all the other matters. The Zohar Kadosh says, even when it comes to Shabbat, avoid talking about business on Shabbat, about talking about investments of Shabbat. On Shabbat, we should concentrate positive topics, happy topics, even though business sometimes is very happy. Let's say you sold the property and you got paid, right? That's a beautiful, happy moment, correct? True. But don't bring it to the Shabbat table. Because one question is, oh, how much you make for an apartment? Oh, 3%, 6%. Oh, I have a guy that pays you 8%. Only pay you 3%. They're taking advantage of you. Guess what? A simple, happy comment from your part, it gave you a whole shi'ur. And then... If you got paid less, how are you going to feel? Not too happy. And this is only one example that is very easy to relate to. So, by Zet Hashem, the Zahut of Hacham Obadiah Yosef, the Zahut of today's Perashat Noah, and the beautiful message of the Gemara from Pesachim. Imagine if to say the word Tameh, okay, which means impure, is a bad word according to the Torah. Imagine the other words that the Goim speak when they talk about on the street, how detrimental it is for the mind and the spirit of the person. It's like, you know, somebody asks you, how are things? Oh, things are very bad. God forbid that a person should say these things. Because that word, God forbid, becomes a magnet. You can say, Be'ezat Hashem will be better. Thank God, whatever God wants will be. Always more on a positive and suitable way. And not, God forbid, the opposite.
My good friends, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. This call is Shalom Rabot. Let's do this. Let's finish uh, Kaddish, and we're going to make a special Ashkava afterwards. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia Omer, Ratzah Kadosh Baruch Hu lezakot et Yisrael Fichat. Irba le'en Torah mizbot she'ne'emar Adonai hafez lema'an sitko yagdil Torah ve'yadir. Amen. 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 Yeshemir Abba Mibarek. Le'alem. Le'alme. 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 Amen. Amen. Dime atrás, Jadén. Amén. Veremos, ve a Salam. Amén. Amén. Ve a Jochma, me intima se, ese me combina, me rajem, me colbriota, voy a José Rajem al Nefesh, Rajon Shamash, el Hajam Akasher, Maram, Hajam Obadia, Yosef, Ven Gorgia, Sheniftar, que hay Yom Azé, Roj Hashem, Tenijeno, Vegan Eden, Hube, Hol, Venez, Jochum, Rosel, la Jot, Vegeni, Irazón, Ven Omar, Amén. Rabotai, feel free to light a candle in memory of Hajam Obadia, Yosef, Ven Gorgia, Leva Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Umeborach, to everybody.